um, a very good evening to Aiza Kolkata. Uh, this is Chitradeep, a senior research fellow from Center of Excellence in Space Sciences India, and also one of the members of Logistics Committee, National Space Science Exhibition, which is being held at the city of Kolkata at various, across various venues, including Science City, Bila Industrial and Technological Museum, also University of Kolkata, uh, Presidency University, St. Xavier's College. And uh, this started on uh, 6th of uh, December this year and will uh, end on 11th of December. So as the weekend is approaching, I would like to invite you all to pay a visit there. We have some interesting programs lined up. We have a, a Women in Space Science panel, which is scheduled tomorrow. We have Industry Academia Interactions, scheduled on Sunday. Please uh, consider pay a visit also. We'll be distributing a free pass from any visitor from Isa Kolkata and any other uh, educational organizations. So with that, uh, I'd like to call upon a uh, request to uh, come uh, Dr. Udipta Chakraborty, who is a postdoctoral fellow working with uh, Professor Shumona Annagiri, uh, Department of Biological Sciences, as a Kolkata. Uh, Dr. Chakraborty, please, the stage is yours. Thank you, Chitradeep. So, I, good evening, everyone. So I welcome you all to this talk. So firstly, I like to welcome our director, Professor Prashant Panigrahi, and request him to say something about National Space Science Exhibition and ISA Kolkata. Sir, please. I went there for the first time yesterday, and it was very fascinating. Okay, so thank you, uh, Chitradeep and Dipto. So, you know, I mean, uh, before going to ISOR or National Space Science Exhibition, I mean, it's really fascinating when you look at the title. That, uh, you know, as, uh, we have all read that how the animals, how the birds, you know, d detect their neighborhood through light, like us. For example, uh, you know, there, are, there was one recent article I was reading, human eye is so sensitive it can detect three photons, up to resolution of three photons. Polarized light, for example, honey, bee, and others, they make use of it. It's fascinating from that aspect. So I never thought of a donk's view of the, you know, Milky Way. I only remember that in autumn, in our village, we used to see this clear sky and this path. Milky Way used to dream about what are all those things. Then as you grow up, you know about the stars, and it has a huge, you know, black hole inside. And now, for example, with this web, you know, photographs, what you see, what a fascinating story. So coming back to our reality that, uh, you know, all, some of you are new, and because, I you know, post-COVID, we are slowly coming back to normalcy. It's a pleasure to have Professor Nath here. And I was in RRI a few days back, and uh, I was telling him that we have common friends through which, you know, we know about each other. I know about his work also. And, uh, you know, for example, if you look at uh, RRI, Raman Research Institute, that's a fascinating place. You know, it was the place which Raman started. He had tremendous interest in anything that is involving color, light, light matter interactions, starting from flowers to bees to minerals, all those things. If you go to RI one day, visit their museum where they have these beautiful, fascinating crystals, you know, an amazing story about Ramon as a scientist. Coming back uh, to, uh, you know, uh, ISO Kolkata, some of, most of you know that we started our life in 2006 in, uh, you know, Khodapur Extension Center in uh, Calcutta. We, uh, I joined here in 2007, December. Life was very nice, fun. You go and have your idli, dosa, and walk around that area. Evening time, go for fun, movie. And then for after a year and a half, in 2009, summer, we shifted here. Gao, Hamara, you know, I, when I came here, it was exactly like my village when I left for USA. So I was very happy. I have been here now more than 15 years, and I've enjoyed every bit of it. Nature in its pristine form. And many aspects, you know, certainly a dong from here would be having a Milky Way's view. So that much, you know, you can tell for sure. But, you know, as we progressed, for example, uh, we department started, we, you know, I remember, for example, some of our students looking at this black ant in that old thing and the night time mapping how they are going. And the talks are very popular talks. And a lot more people used to attend these popular talks and the qu quality of science. But as we moved, departments formed, number increased. 
so you know people have specified kind of interest but fortunately our interdisciplinary character has stayed very strongly and that for that you people have to be credited because our ICS students for example do take interdisciplinary very seriously I have seen many of you from physics doing projects with biology somebody from chemistry doing in biology variety of things so that's the way forward and you'll be happy to know that national education policy has taken many things essentially from us interdisciplinarity project oriented science and hands on you know learning through hands on experiments and that's what we do and we do practice it here so I just wanted to tell it in front of Professor Nath so that he takes note of this fact that you know, NEP has taken a lot of things from us. But again, let me also admit, we have taken a lot of things from IISC and Bangalore in general because our quote-unquote founding fathers had their origin from there. We started our life with this uh, you know, memorandum of understanding from IISC. Now we have our own act and, uh, and you know, things have moved on. And roughly we take around 250 students per year. That is BSMS, our flagship program, and then you know, MA, PhD, integrated PhD after BSc. Then subsequently, you know, we have now master's program, at least in mathematics and chemistry. Others are also beginning in our master's program. Now, uh, you know, PhD, master's, and uh, we have in CC, for example, master's by research. So that is a where the students come from technology side. Has been quite successful because, for example, I saw uh, this talk by, uh, what's her name, Abhyatha, right? Abhyatha, she came, I remember distinctly, that uh, she was involved with this, uh, Aditya, you know, L1 mission, that equipment design. He came from the engineering side. It's a remarkable thing to see how our, now she has joined Tata Research Center, right? Tata how Tata. our people have grown up, contributed to the nation's, you know, mission towards, you know, various satellite building, things like that, now joined Tata Research Center. So I, you know, she see that way has done a remarkable job. You know, Chitradeep invited you. Please go there and see. You will see fascinating, you know, the kind of stall they have put up, the kind of footfall, people from all over Calcutta are coming there. So I again support him. Please go there. If you want, I think we can, people can arrange a bus from here. Okay, so it's a remarkable thing. Be happy that CC is doing such a good thing for us. So I, without much effort, I'll take, I know you please take over this thing. Thank you, thank you, Professor Panigray. Now, let's come to the talk, today's attraction. So today's talk is the, it's titled, A Dung Beetle View of the Milky Way by Professor Bimannath. Although today's speaker needs no introduction, but I would like to have the opportunity to say some free words about him. Professor Nath is from Raman Research Institute, Bangalore. He is known for his groundbreaking research uh, <coughs> in theoretical astrophysics. His research interest includes studying of the evolution of galaxy and diffuse gas in the universe. He is also keenly interested in the history of science, and he is a prolific science writer. He has written multiple books, such as The Story of Helium and Birth of Astrophysics, Dawn of the Universe, Eyes on the Sky, as The Story of Telescope. And he is writer of two novels. One of them is Nothing is Blue. He has also written uh, books in Bengali, namely Mohabishya Prothumalo, and Nakhotregan. He has been awarded the Tagore Prize from Poshimango Bangla Academy for his book Mohabishya Prothumalo. He has won the Indira Gandhi Award from INSA for popularizing science. He is fascinated by how living organisms perceive celestial cues. And in today's talk, he will explain how these cues in the night sky are utilized by animals to navigate the journeys they, are, they undertake here on Earth. So let us welcome Professor Nath on stage for delivering his talk. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And I should like to thank the organizers of uh, National Space Science uh, Exhibition um, uh, for inviting me here, especially in ISAR Kolkata. Uh, it's the first time I'm visiting here. Um, I should like to begin with a few disclaimers. Um, I'm not going to talk about any um, new uh, groundbreaking discovery in astronomy or uh, new uh, concepts in astrophysics uh, or in space science. I'm going to talk about a strange topic, really. Uh, I'm going to talk about what I'm called uh, philastronomers among the animal kingdom. By uh, philo-astronomers, I, I, I mean those organisms 
which use um, the night sky, the starry sky, uh, for various purposes in their daily lives. And I would like to talk about how do they go about doing it. Um, the second disclaimer is that I have not worked on this. This is not my uh, research work. I've been basically fascinated by this question that, you know, how do other organisms that we share uh, this world with, how do they perceive the universe? It's the same sky they, they look at uh, as we do. Um, so this is not my research work. And uh, also I'm not a biologist and my uh, knowledge of biology is uh, very, very limited. And um, so, yeah. So with this disclaimer, so let's, uh, so let's begin. I, I would like to basically ask these questions. Can other organisms other than human being uh, see the stars? And uh, if so, how do they use uh, these celestial cues um, for their needs? Um, let me begin with um, a few examples. Now, the case of the migratory birds is uh, very fascinating. There have been very um, many clever experiments with homing pigeons, as uh, you, all of you may know, uh, how they use the, uh, the sun to um, determine the latitude and even measure time. In other words, the relative longitude. But the case of migratory birds, especially the, those birds which uh, fly at night, uh, is really fascinating. And there have been some really interesting experiments with them. Um, especially with uh, in uh, starting with 1960s, um, Stephen Emlin in US, he started experimenting um, in the city of Flint in the planetarium. Um, um, he used to set up after the evening shows uh, over. Uh, he used to set up his own uh, experimental setup, you know, with uh, staircases and uh, the. Uh, he made a contraption uh, here. It's called the uh, Emlin funnel now. Um, to the, the, the migratory urge of these birds when they see the night sky is so strong that they uh, jump towards the migratory direction uh, even when they're caged. And that can be recorded in this, uh, in, in this uh, device. So this bird is seated on an inked cushion in the center and there's a wire mesh on the top so that they can see the night sky freely. And it's the shape in the, uh, in the form of a funnel, and the sides are covered with blotting paper. So when they see the night sky, um, uh, basically they start flapping their wings, they make the some uh, strange sounds with their throat, and they keep jumping. Uh, and then they want to jump on the wall, they cannot, they slide down, and they keep jumping again. And those directions, the scratch marks, are recorded on the blotting paper, which then can be uh, uh, studied at leisure later. Uh, in which direction were the jumping. And in a planetarium, one can uh, control the, uh, uh, the stars. Which stars are you going to show? Which stars, which clues are you going to show the, uh, the, to the birds? And so you can do some experiments. Uh, so anyway, uh, migratory birds, we know that you know, they use sun's position as a compass, but I'm talking about the, those birds uh, which fly at night. So Stephen Emlin start, uh, used, this is Stephen Emlin in the planetarium with his funnels here, and he used uh, indigo bunting as um, his, uh, his um, experimental case. These birds fly towards the south in fall and fly towards the north in spring. Okay, And uh, so uh, in the planetarium, we could ch change the stellar system, and uh, then he would notice the uh, which way that they fly. So he did a very fascinating experiment. He did a, a series of experiments. And then he, uh, from Flint, he moved to uh, Cornell University. Uh, and then he wrote, he wrote a very, uh, very nice article in Scientific American that you can look up. So uh, I'm going to talk about one of these experiments that he did, uh, did uh, where he, so we know that you know, all the stars, like the sun, uh, all the stars move from the east to west and around an axis which uh, points towards the pole star. That's the because our Earth axis points towards the pole star. So all the stars move from east to west. Um, so this is the pole star. So the pole star doesn't move. All the other stars do. Right? Um, so he divided uh, these indigo bunting uh, 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 birds into three groups. One of the groups was uh, raised under the night sky, clear night sky. The second group was raised in the planetarium, but with an artificial sky, where the stars were made to rotate around a star in Orion constellation. It's called Betelgeuse. 
so it's a bright red star in uh, Orion. So the stars were made to rotate around that uh, uh, constellation and not pole star. Okay? That's the artificialness uh, about it. And the third group of st uh, birds were raised, was raised uh, without uh, uh, showing them the night sky. They couldn't see the night sky at all. So then when did the time came, they grew up and the time came for migration. The first group which grew up in the uh, clear night sky, they had the perfect sense of direction. The second group of birds which uh, grew up in the planetarium under this artificial sky, they thought they flew towards Betelgeuse in spring because that thought they thought that's the pole star and that's the north. Okay, and the third group of birds, which were not given any celestial cues, they were totally clueless, I mean, as far as uh, directions were concerned. So, so th this basically proves that, first of all, um, the, uh, the, uh, the stars are used uh, by the birds to uh, sense the direction. And also the fact that they learn, they, they, they learn this, they, they it's not an innate knowledge, it's not genetically coded, encoded, it couldn't have been. Because we know, you know, that the, the, uh, there is a wobble of the Earth's x axis. There's a slight wobble. The Earth's axis um, moves in a circle uh, with a period of about 26,000 years. Okay? It's a very slow movement, uh, which makes the st stellar pattern change um, over uh, tens of thousands of years, but which is smaller than the evolutionary time scale. So, uh, since the you know stellar pattern changes. Uh, um, uh, a lot within the uh, 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 in a time scale which is less than the evolutionary time scale. So these knowledge couldn't have been genetically encoded. They probably learned from experiences. So these are interesting uh, 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 experiments that he had done. Let's move on to some other creature. How about a small creature like moth? Moths, uh, as you know, I mean they look like butterfly, but they're not. Uh, they're very different from butterflies. Unfortunately, um, there haven't been any uh, m uh, many experiments with moth except this one uh, study in 1979 in Manchester, in England, uh, where Robin Baker and his student uh, Satyabandhu, they um, uh, they made a contraption with which they could determine the flapping of the wings of this particular moth, large yellow mm -hmm. underwing, um, and they did some experiment to eliminate different possibilities by which they uh, navigate. So uh, they eliminated wind, they eliminated magnetic field, and they had a only tentative conclusion that they probably use celestial cues. But unfortunately, there haven't been any follow-up. So there are lots of scope for uh, experiments like this. Another creature that uh, was not really followed up is uh, cricket frog. Um, uh, this was done in the 1960s in the US, in the Mississippi region. Um, so let me uh, see, in the Bluff Lake region. So uh, what they had done, they collected these frogs from different parts of this lake, okay, and then they brought into the laboratory. Uh, there was uh, basically a water container which was high, um, it, it was tall, uh, uh, tall sides, and it was 20 meter in diameter. So they collected these frogs from different parts of the lake, maybe the southern part of the lake, northern part of the lake, and they would, bring to the laboratory and uh, s m m drop them, just uh, throw them in the water and watch them, was the direction in which they are swimming. So they, sh they were, uh, basically they were noticing whether they f swim towards the, w whatever their home is. If they were collected from the southern s shore, then they should come back to the south. So that's where they were, uh, 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 th this is what uh, they were noticing. Now, um, in sunlight, for example, they could uh, sense the direction. Uh, at night, with moon, it was okay. I mean, there was some uh, hazardness, but not much. In when there's no moon, only starry sky, there was they they noticed something very interesting. The there was a bimodality. They either f uh, swam towards the north or towards the south. Now, this is the paper uh, by Ferguson et al. Um, the astronomical orientation of the, um, uh, the southern cricket frog. And there's this paragraph here, which let me read out. Uh, so they, they could think of only one reason why they, the frogs were going either towards the north or towards the south. There had to be something that was dividing the sky into north and south, and there was the Milky Way. You know, the Milky Way uh, extends uh, like an arc from east to west. 
and uh, that divides the sky into north and south and it's 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 uh, just a speculation so they speculated that the basis for the bidirectional uh, pattern of stellar orientation is not known possibly cricket frogs discern the linearity of the summer sky that results from the greater density of stars in the milky way and use it as a longitudinal axis of reference okay so this is just a speculation tentative uh, uh, speculation and it was not followed up unfortunately there was another uh, animal for which there have been some experiments uh, interesting experiments and that, that's to do with harbor seals the seals they swim uh, up to a few kilometers uh, 50 kilometers uh, sometimes they uh, for f days and for after a few days they come back uh, to their nest and it has been a question of uh, uh, some interest why wha how do they navigate how do they uh, keep their sense of direction now in a sea it's actually very difficult birds for them it's one thing to for example they have some you know information about the terrain for the sea it's it's uh, it's, it's something else and also for aquatic animals it's uh, you can ask other questions for example the 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 eye of the aquatic animals is particularly suited for looking through the water because the, the, the corneal fluid has the same reflective index as similar as the saline water. So the, the, the bending of uh, the light in the seawater and in the corneal fluid is the same. It only bends in the lens and so it focuses and forms the image. Right? So this is perfectly suited for saline water. When they look up and see the stars through air, for example, then the reflection index, reflective index of the corneal fluid will start to be a hindrance and your image will not form on the retina but in front of the retina which would make them myopic so uh, one wonders how uh, whether their vision will be uh, good at all but there were some experiments this is uh, from an experiment uh, in um, uh, 15 years ago almost um, by a uh, sense uh, by a team of german scientists um, the four-year-old uh, uh, harbor seal which uh, they uh, named um, fondly named nick and so there was this contraption that they make made. So uh, the this, the seal was supposed to put his uh, mouth uh, into this uh, uh, into this tube. Uh, it's about 15 centimeter in diameter, and it could be rotated to s look at different directions in the sky. And so this uh, this is where the scientists could stand. And there was a there was a, 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 a device was made so that you know scientists also could see what the seal was seeing okay and uh, the seal was trained to uh, ring a button uh, push a button uh, if it could see any star okay so if it uh, uh, saw a star and then the, uh, the, the, the scientists were monitoring it and it would uh, take out its mouth and push a button and it would be f uh, given a fish f as a reward and if it did so uh, by mistake, uh, without seeing a star, then it won't be given a fish. So that's how they were trained. And uh, so uh, they, the scientists could find out that, you know, they could see uh, bright stars like Sirius, man, uh, 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 planets like Venus, and not only that, even faint stars. So they could determine the faintness, the, the faintness level of this uh, seal's vision of the stars. and. Uh, this is a comparison of the stars that we see as human beings and these the stars that the seals see. Okay, they don't see as many stars, for example, they are missing out on many faint stars. But the number of stars that they see is not insignificant. Okay, the faintness level of seals is, uh, so this they can see only about four times as uh, 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 bright stars as uh, the mm, f f about the you know, faintest limit that human beings can see. Um, then there have been experiments by the same group later on uh, in a planetarium where they uh, built a water container in a planetarium and they put uh, the uh, two harbor seals and they created, uh, they, they, they had the stars which were rotating around the pole star. So uh, initially they trained the seals by pointing out with a laser pointer with some particular star and basically they would signal that you know you would s swim towards that star. Then they, they let the stars rotate around the pole star, just as the stars in the sky, you know, do. 
and it, they realized the the scientists realized that they didn't have to point the uh, with the laser pointer anymore because they could sense that the star that they have been trained to follow is not going to be in the same place at the same uh, at different times that they were uh, going on an arc and so they could sense that again very interesting stuff right um so I mean, one could go on and on, and I, I have more uh, such animals, but uh, then you know, uh, one could then uh, make a list of uh, how different animals uh, uh, view stars, and it will be a very long list, uh, because uh, the the way, uh, for example, a beetle looks at stars and uh, MPB and the seals uh, uh, look at stars is very different. Uh, it's probably. Uh, uh, would make sense to talk about the evolution of eyes and then that will uh, help us to classify uh, the different uh, types of eye. So we know that you know eyes basically emerged on Earth during what, call uh, what is called the Cambrian era. Um, this is the first of the geological time in the Paleozoic era, which literally means the, uh, the time of the ancient life. So this is about um, uh, 543 million years ago. Uh, and with a span of about uh, just about uh, 50 million years before um, uh, uh, the Cambrian era ended. And this era witnessed a dramatic burst in the evolutionary changes of life. Um, the number of and variety of life forms that uh, appeared in this, uh, in this era was amazing and, um, and is often called the evolutionary um, Big Bang of life because of the uh, the burst in the evolutionary changes in life. And one of the reasons that people think that there was this uh, big evolutionary big bang of life is the emergence of vision. Vision basically started the first arms race in the world in the sense that once vision emerged, uh, there was an evolutionary urge in other animals to, uh, to protect themselves or to improve upon the mechanisms of vision to go and hunt. And uh, so, it probably started with some very simple photoreceptor on the skin of some uh, uh, organism. Most of these organisms were uh, marine animals, so we don't have, the, there's no fossil evidence because there was no eye socket. Um, uh, but there are, there's a way to actually trace it evolutionary because we know uh, the, 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 uh, the basic photoreceptor uh, has to do with the protein called opsin, which binds with a uh, molecule called uh, chromophore which has different isomers. So when uh, light interacts with chromophore, it bends and uh, leaves the opsin, which sends a sensory signal to the brain that the light has been detected. Uh, and then it uh, bends back and it gets back its opsin. So it's like a car key and it starts, uh, when it rotates, it starts the engine here in this uh, case, the sensory process, okay? And one knows the genes associated with the production of opsin which is how one can evolutionary uh, uh, trace the evolution of the eye genetically, um, uh, even though uh, some of the in some cases you don't have fossil evidences. So uh, basically, it started with, as I said, some photoreceptors on the skin of an organism, which could sense light and darkness. So that brought some advantages to follow the diurnal rhythm. Mm -hmm. Then one had, um, uh, in the second step, uh, what appeared is a pigment. Um, uh, which would block the light in other direction. So that brought some directionality in the optical system. So one could now uh, sense which in which direction the potential hunter was by looking at the light and shadow. And then this basically the, the, the group of cells, uh, the photoreceptors form the first eye. Uh, and this eye patch slowly deepened into a pit. So the light would enter into this hole and uh, this is like a pinhole camera and there would be an image formed on this side. Uh, it's a blurry image because the number of photoreceptors was not uh, uh, very large, uh, but uh, some image. And then slowly this uh, vitreous mass uh, would uh, uh, condensed and um, formed a lens that we have now in, the, in our eyes. Um, and and in, in, in some cases, some organisms uh, developed uh, multiple eyes where there would be uh, uh, the light would be uh, channeled into different, what is called the omatidia, each with its own lens and uh, photoreceptors. Because um, uh, to basically have a large field of view, so that you could uh, look at, you know, sense the predators from even from different directions. 
So that's their advantage. But that actually degrades the resolution. And this is what I want to talk about. Um, so yeah, this is the pinhole camera. This is uh, Nautilus. It's, uh, it's an extinct uh, mollusk type of animal. It had a, a pinhole camera type of uh, eye. And the evolution of eye basically took a very, very s uh, a short time, just about a half a million year, which is like a blink of an eye uh, in the evolutionary time scale. N in fact, there's a, a very nice book by Andrew Parker called um, In the Blink of an Eye. Uh, it's about that, it's about this topic. Anyway, so uh, I talked about these compound eyes, which uh, has bigger field of view, but has poor angular resolution. And now let's talk about that. Why? And that is to do with, oh, uh, before that, I, let me just show this picture. There used to be some confusion about how the, uh, the, 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 the insects, basically compound eyes first appear in trilobites, which belong to arthropods. And so uh, even now we uh, see the, uh, uh, the compound eyes in insects. For example, fly and uh, dung beetle, for example, and there was has to be some confusion about how do they actually perceive the the external world? Mm. Do they see multiple images of the same thing, or um, or something else? So this is what actually they see. This is a simulation of, for example, what they would see uh, as a flower. So why uh, b b um, why uh, do the compound eyes have uh, poor resolution? It's something to do with the wave nature of light. We, we know that when uh, light enters into a hole, into, uh, through an aperture, it spreads out. There is a diffraction. Uh, and uh, actually, it has been established that uh, small pupil sizes, the eyes are limited by diffraction, this process of diffraction. So what happens, I mean, you can uh, you do this experiment, right? I mean, it, it will happen to any wave, even water wave. If you uh, have a water container and divide into two halves with a small hole here and generate waves, and you can uh, look at how the waves are spreading out on the in the second half, uh, it will all depend on the the size of this aperture, this hole, and it actually depends on the ratio of the size of the hole and the wavelength. Okay, and the the ratio, the, the this this is the angular uh, size of the how it is spreading out. And this is the wavelength. Forget about this small factor of 1.22. We call this Aries uh, disk. Right? And this is the aperture size. So this is the ratio of the wavelength to the aperture size. The smaller the ratio, the, uh, the, uh, the waves are not spread out uh, uh, so much. The if the angle is large, then the waves spread out a lot. Right? Uh, so when you do an experiment with light, for example, you, uh, you, s uh, you have a source of light and uh, let it go through a hole and the light is then um, uh, made to fall on a screen, then you would see not just a, a point of light, but a spread out uh, 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 central portion, which is spread out here. And that angle is uh, equal to this. That's called Aries disk. And you also see some patterns of light and darkness. Uh, so uh, for example, it can be uh, represented like this. So it's the bright central disk that is of importance here. Okay, how big or how small is the bright central disk? Because, uh, because, suppose I'm going to look at, so anyway, so as the focal plane, for example, uh, I'll just multiply the, the linear size of the image, uh, A, this disk will be, I'll just multiply by the F uh, focal length, and so this is the F ratio. Okay, in uh, w those who are adept in uh, photographing, you would know the importance of the F ratio. So, why is it important? Suppose I'm looking at two stars, which are very close by, okay? The angular dif uh, 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 difference between, uh, angle between the two stars, suppose it's very, very small. Each star is going to produce this pattern, this diffraction pattern, with this central uh, patch, bright patch, and then uh, the, the patterns around it, right? Now, if this central bright patch is large, then in this case of two very adjacent stars, I might not be able to distinguish these two stars because they would overlap if the bright patch is large, okay? Which means I won't be able to resolve these two stars. That's called the resolving power, okay? So uh, 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 these two stars would appear to me as one single blur in the sky, right? So this is what I'm sh showing here. This is, the, uh, this is w uh, if it all depends on the, the, the size of the central bright patch, which is the Aries disk, right? So that's the angle. So what I mean is that our image 
is not faithful. This is the smallest angle that is uh, discernible. Okay, by, by the way, this is the same. Uh, this is the reason why we big bil, uh, bigger telescopes, because uh, bigger telescopes, the A will be large, so the lambda over A will be very small, so we will be able to resolve. So when you bigger build a uh, bigger telescope, uh, the image becomes clearer, so we can resolve, right? Um, now. Uh, let me just, yeah. So f in the case of um, human beings, the resolving power is uh, 1 60th of a degree. It's about an arc minute. So when you go to uh, get your uh, specs done, uh, the optician asks you to, uh, that there is a chart that uh, he or she asks you to read, right? And it's kept as a, s a distance of six meter. And you are supposed to read those lines. And the sixth line, there's a line uh, underlined because that's an important. Uh, if you can read the letters here, then uh, the operation would say that in your eye uh, sight is normal. And because uh, if you look at one of the letters, the 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 s sides, uh, uh, the smallest size here, with a subtendent angle at a distance of six meter, an angle of one arc minute. So that's one sixtieth of a degree. That's our resolving power of human eye. Let's keep that in mind. Uh, so let's if we make a very simple assumption that the eye aperture is simply proportional to the body size. Let's make a simple assumption. It may or may not be correct. Then I can say that the bigger the size of the body, the bigger, bigger the animal, the bigger the eye aperture, and so the resolving power is better. I can, uh, so the, the I, I would get a, 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 a relation like this. This is the body height, and this is the resolving power. Okay, human beings are here. It's about one arc minute. Um, this is actual data. This is from Kirschfeld in 1976. And of course, there's some scatter here because this assumption of uh, uh, the body size being uh, uh, linearly proportional to the eye size is not quite true. Uh, we look at elephant uh, and look at a falcon, for example. Right? The falcon has much bigger uh, eye uh, compared to its body size. Bats are here. They're worse off because, well, they have gone on a different uh, evolutionary path because they don't use uh, vision for uh, locating. They use sound waves. But anyway, there is a, 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 a for example, cats are here. That's tenth of a size of our body. So the resolving power is also uh, one uh, ten times worse. Okay. Now going back to uh, the resolving power resolution limit. The this angle is the smallest angle that is discernible by an eye. Okay. Which means the image on the retina retina is not faithful to the angles uh, uh, smaller than this. I can think of spatial frequency, which is inversely proportional to angle. Okay? So here, for example, spatial frequency, this is the uh, units of cycles per uh, radian, for example. So highest, highest spatial frequencies here. So I can then say, this is inversely proportional to the angle. Right? So I can say that my image in the retina has an upper cutoff of spatial frequency, okay? <coughs> upper cutoff of spatial frequency, and which is inversely proportional to the angle. Now we know there's a question of, I have got an image on my retina. How densely do I sample it in order to get a faithful image in my brain? I need to sample it. That comes from sampling theorem, the information theory, right? Uh, as you know, this, uh, as I said, you know, the image has an upper spatial uh, frequency cutoff. This is like a band-limited function. Band-limited function is uh, whose Fourier transform has uh, uh, upper uh, cutoff, right? And you know from information theory, the sampling theorem, there's a Nyquist uh, 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 frequency that this information about any function can be faithfully obtained if you sample it at twice the upper cutoff frequency. That's comes from spatial uh, uh, sampling theorem. So in the case of uh, the vision, for example, then, sorry, in the case of simple, uh, our image, it has to be twice the highest frequency, right? So for example, in our eye, it has to be uh, two photoreceptors in one um, Aries disc, two per arc minute. And it turns out to be yes. It's about two photoreceptors per, per this is the Aries disc. Uh, in the central bright, bright disc. This is the diffraction pattern, okay? This is the central bright disc, and this is the Aries disc, and uh, there's about, about two photoreceptors. Just what the sampling theorem 
uh, uh, says, says that you know it, it suffices to get a faithful image uh, uh, to be uh, sent across to the brain. Then you could ask the question, why did evolution stop here and not build smaller photoreceptors and more uh, uh, sample it even more densely, right? What stopped it there? Um, and there is an interesting reason for that. And that reason comes from physics. Uh, the, 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 the road of sins, basically, you can think of uh, as tiny waveguides. These photoreceptors are basically tiny waveguides. They're like fiber optics, okay? And um, it cannot be too narrow because they'll be leaking, the electromagnetic waves would leak out and there'll be loss of information. And there'll be crosstalk between the photoreceptors. And that crosstalk would uh, then make uh, the, you know, the photoreceptors not very independent, which I is needed for sampling theorem to be valid, by the way. And for fiber optics, uh, uh, one uh, defines a dimensionless quantity called V parameter. It depends on this is the R, the size of the waveguide, uh, the radius of the waveguide. This is the lambda is the uh, uh, wavelength. And these are the refractive indexes of the waveguide material and the ambient, which is fixed. For this case, the lipoprotein that is uh, the your waveguide is made of and water, right? And lambda is fixed, say 500 nanometer for optical uh, wavelengths. So you look at the, uh, this, is, uh, this is the uh, eta parameter and then if, it depends on how many modes, uh, if it is the fundamental mode or uh, multiple modes that are uh, being uh, 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 um, uh, transmitting through the waveguide. The mono mode is not very, uh, it's, it's vulnerable to perturbations in the waveguide. So one needs more than one mode for which B V has to be larger than 2.5. And if the V is has to be larger than 2.5, this is fixed, you, there is a lower limit on R, lower limit on the size of the waveguides. And if you put in these uh, values of uh, the lipoprotein uh, and water uh, wavelengths, uh, 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 refractive indices, then you get a radius which is of the order of one to two micron, which is exactly the size of the photoreceptors. You couldn't have sampled uh, 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 more densely. So this concurrence you know, of physics and biology and evolution, it just gives me the goosebumps really. Uh, that anyway, uh, nature has, uh, um, made sure that you know we will get this faithful image there. Anyway, uh, this is a one more fun thing. Uh, we talked about compound I. Now suppose I say that a compound I also had the same kind of resolution, kind of limit, and then match it with a simple I. Then um, I would uh, have to do the in the compound I, the inter omotidial uh, angle has to be equal to the, uh, the, the angle subtended by each uh, uh, facet to the center of the eye. So the delta theta has to be also equal to A over R. And so if I write uh, new uh, uh, square, then this, is this comes from A this disk and this is one over theta. Then A will cancel and I will get the radius of the R, uh, this, uh, this uh, size of the eye, be proportional to the square of the uh, uh, spatial uh, uh, frequency. So if I ask for a two millimeter resolution, uh, oh, oh sorry, one degree resolution, then uh, R of uh, radius of a two millimeter is fine, which is there in the case of flies and um, animals. But if I want human-like visual acuity with a compound eye, then I would need a radius of about seven meters. Uh, this is a very simple calculation, but uh, uh, this has been done by Kirchfeld uh, later, and we said that you know it, it's what R is about one meter. So if we had a compound eye with the same resolution, we would have an eye uh, of uh, one meter in radius, which would have been very, very cumbersome. Okay, so thank God that you know, we don't have compound eye. Um, so let's go, go back to some of the, uh, the animals or the insects which have compound eye. So now we know that they have very poor resolution. So let's talk about the dung beetle. Their resolution turns out to be of the order of two to three degrees. It's not uh, much because what is the angular uh, size of the sun? It's about half a degree. S this moon is the same size this, uh, because uh, that's why we have eclipses, by the way, right? So half a degree. So they can't really uh, resolve the sun. They see it as a blurry patch, the right, the the, the dung beetles. But they can sense it. There have been experiments by a uh, uh, hundred years ago by Sanchi by blocking their view of the sun and uh, see whether they can uh, 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 hold on to their path. 
So they do, uh, they can sense, sense the, uh, uh, the st sun. But the uh, stars, they cannot see the stars individually because every star they would see as a, a blurry and faint patch of about two to three degrees. That's the Aries disk for them because of diffraction, right? But um, interestingly, so they have what is called the superposition eye. So what they have done is uh, uh, bring in uh, the uh, light signals from different omatidia and then connect them. So that increases the uh, field of view, okay? The, the resolution is poor, but the field of view is large, which helps them, which helps them. So let me talk about the uh, dung beetle a little bit first. So this is a dung beetle, basically 4-H for, for dung, and they roll it into a pile. Um, and then uh, look at this, they're rotating. They sort of, it's called the dance of the uh, dung beetle. And people used to think that they're probably just dancing because of the joy of you know, having found the uh, dung pile. Uh, and then they, did you see the way, the strange way that they push this with their hind legs? Okay, so they, it's like uh, they hold onto their uh, front uh, limbs and they you know, push with their uh, hind legs. So people used to think that you know, they dance around <coughs> in joy, but actually it's not. In the recent experiments have shown that what they see, um, they actually look at the sky. These are, these are dung beetles which forage at night. Okay. And because of the large field of view, although they cannot discern the individual eye, uh, the patterns like Milky Way, where there's a dense uh, uh, assemblage of stars, right? They can actually sense that. So this is uh, sort of a simulation of how they w look at the Milky Way. This is how we look at the Milky Way. I'm sorry about the uh, poor resolution here. Um, uh, this picture is courtesy James Gould. This is uh, not published, by the way. So uh, when I was, uh, I asked him, uh, he. Uh, uh, very grac graciously uh, uh, gave me this picture that he has produced. Uh, this is North Star, and as you can see, the you cannot see any individual stars here, but it's like a blurry patch. So this is how Dung Beetle views the Milky Way. And they use this for navigation. Um, so this is uh, some experiments from Mary Decke, um, which uh, this is one of the variations uh, that they have done. They would uh, make a circular arena and they would put uh, the dung uh, and the dung beetle in the center and uh, watch, uh, look at the time that they take to come to the edge of the arena. Uh, this is another variation where they, there was a, a second step uh, and they would uh, look at whether they can uh, still hold on to the same direction. And so the time taken by the dung beetle to uh, reach the edge was taken as some sort of a measure of the you know straightness uh, of, of the rolling root straightness, right? Uh, this is their experiments uh, being done at night. Um, they have done it with moon uh, and without moon. Uh, so this is in the planetarium. This is the histogram of the time to reach the, uh, uh, the, 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 the edge of the arena. Uh, look at this, um, these two histograms here. With the starry sky and with the Milky Way. So in the planetarium, you know, you could switch on and off different uh, celestial cues. You could see uh, only 4,000 bright stars, 100 bright stars, only the Milky Way, not the Milky Way, etc. You could do a control experiment in a, in a planetarium. And it turns out that Milky Way enough, uh, Milky Way is enough for them to navigate. All right? So, and they have done several such experiments here. Uh, they also can uh, sense the polarization, and that is done through rhodopsin, which is a long and uh, uh, stretched uh, molecule that talked about the waveguides. And when the E vectors of the electromagnetic wave falls uh, aligned to the, the, the molecule, it, the photoreceptors uh, registers it. And if the E vector is not aligned, then it doesn't register to the same extent. So the insects can actually uh, sense the, degree, uh, the, the, uh, the polarization. We know that in the case of uh, beetles, right? Beetles are known to uh, sense the polarization um, uh, because, well, I mean, the sunlight is not polarized. When, when the sunlight is uh, scattered by air molecules, it gets polarized, uh, especially at 90 degrees from the sun. So when the sun is in the horizon at uh, during sunset and sunrise, there is the, the degree of polarization along the zenith is large. So you see a band of polarized light. Bees are supposed to know this, and there have been a lot of experiments of uh, bees' navigation. Um, 
dung beetles can also do that. Uh, it turns out that uh, dung beetles uh, can also uh, navigate with the polarization of the moonlight. This is uh, back in um, uh, 2003. This is uh, this came out in Nature. Now the polarization signal in moonlight is is million times weaker than that of in, in the sunlight. Yet they can sense it. Um, there is an interesting difference between the dung beetles uh, sense uh, their uh, the 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 use the uh, polarization signals from bees. Uh, but I let me not get into that because so when they are given conflicting clues, for example, dung beetles uh, behave in a different way. I don't know how much time do I have. Okay, so let's uh, go, go to some other animals. Like uh, I'm very fascinated with spiders. Spiders, and I told you that you know uh, uh, to increase the field of view, the insects uh, uh, developed um, uh, compound eye. But this is one animal which. Um, uh, which uh, didn't use compound eye. They had some modular design of uh, four pairs of eyes, and so the field of view is very large with uh, four pairs of eyes. Look at the, uh, the, f uh, the, 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 the pair of eyes in the front. That's very large, okay? And this is the anterior median eyes. Um, it's very interesting design. Look at the design. It has a tubular uh, design. And with, uh, uh, with a converging lens at the front and the diverging lens, and the back. That's like a telescope, telescopic lens. It's like a telescope. Remember the Galilean telescope that we designed, we, we have learned in the school, with the converging lens in the front and the <coughs> diverging, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, diverging lens in the back. Um, so that's, uh, this is a, a telescope made by nature. And their resolution is about, um, it's about point zero, uh, it's about three arc minutes, so point zero five degrees three times uh, worse than us, right? So one we uh, our, our resolution is one arc minute, this is three arc minutes. But look at the size of this jumping spider. This is a jumping spider of about just a, the about a few centimeters, just a centimeter. All right, so now uh, three arc minutes. Now this is very s much smaller than the, uh, the, the angular size of the sun and the moon that I told you. So they should be able to see the moon. They should be able to see the spots on the moon. Maybe, the, there is an uh, astronomical object which is much larger than the moon, very faint, is our uh, uh, neighboring galaxy, Andromeda galaxy. Okay? It's sometimes a much uh, larger angle than the moon. This is the uh, uh, comparison between the angular sizes of the moon. It's much fainter though. Uh, I mean, uh, to be able to see Andromeda, you will have to see, uh, I don't know whether you can see Andromeda from ISAR uh, uh, Kolkata campus, but you need a dark sky. Uh, the question is whether spiders can see the Andromeda, but for this you need a nocturnal animal so that you know it's not just enough to have a resolution power, but you need to have a large collecting power. So you need um, an eye. Uh, so I was talking to one um, uh, specialist of um, the spider's eye, Nate Moorhouse, and he comes to NCBS uh, uh, sometimes. So he pointed out there's a spider, a nocturnal spider. I want to show you this. This is. Uh, it's a nocturnal spider. It has got uh, an eye. This this lens is probably the largest among the uh, the, the arthropods. It's about uh, 1.4 millimeter diameter. And the resolution is not that great, 1.5 degree, uh, but it's good for as uh, Andromeda. They should be able to see Andromeda. But the the collecting power is very very large. They can collect. Power, this is like uh, almost 2,000 times that of human eye. Okay, but unfortunately. It cannot see the Andromeda. You know why? Can you guess the reason? It never looks up. It basically, it hangs from uh, the uh, trees and forages and uh, kills all the animals. It looks for uh, its prey on the ground. It never looks up. It doesn't know what's missing. Although it has the uh, uh, resolution power and all that. Anyway, so these are some interesting tidbits that I found. So it's not just the you know interesting tidbits. Astronomers have al also gained some knowledge and got some ideas of uh, designs for their uh, uh, telescopes by looking at animal vision. This is uh, lobsters. Lobsters uh, 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 are very unique. They don't use lens. They use the they use uh, um, uh, mirrors. There are two ways you can focus light rays into uh, an image. One is through lens. One is through uh, uh, mirror. Right. There are two only two ways. 
So lobsters use meters. So each omatidia, they they uh, here, the each unit, the light uh, ray uh, is uh, uh, is reflected here and then brought to a focus. Roger Angel, uh, Angel, uh, he uh, so uh, uh, this is the same thing that X-ray astronomers, for example, do. X-ray photons, being very very energetic, is high frequency, right? So H nu is very large. So X-ray photons are very difficult to bring into focus by simple um, um, uh, reflection. If you make them reflect uh, uh, like a Newtonian telescope, uh, Newtonian telescope, you would make the uh, make a mirror here and then uh, make them reflect and then uh, bring to a focus somewhere, right? X-ray photons you cannot do because they'll just go through, just penetrate the mirror. So the only way you can bring X-ray photons to uh, focus and image them is to by slowly uh, bringing them, uh, these are called grazing incidents, grazing uh, reflections, through a set of mirrors. Okay, this is how, for example, X-ray astronomers uh, build their X-ray uh, imaging uh, instruments. It's for example, it's there in our Astrosat, the satellite that uh, um, ISRO has sent. Uh, there is this uh, instrument called SXT, Soft X-ray Telescope, and there is this um, nested. Uh, uh, um, reflecting mirrors, which slowly uh, brings the X-ray into photons, uh, into focus. And uh, so there, Roger Angel, one day he was reading a Scientific American article on animal vision, and he got the idea, why can't we use the lobsters? Lobsters have different omotidia, they have a compound eye, and they use uh, reflection, right? So you could use the same thing for X-rays. If we want, doing the same thing for X-ray, basically in X-ray telescopes like this, the field of view is very, very small. The field of view is very small. But if you have many, many such uh, units, you could have uh, the large field of view. And so uh, this has been. This is called the lobster eye uh, design of the uh, X-ray telescopes. Some of them uh, are being designed for. Uh, there's an X, uh, uh, satellite uh, uh, X-ray sat uh, uh, instrument. So you can see these four of them here. This is the transient high energy sky and um, early universe uh, survey. This is something to do with, uh, this is a NASA project. This is a ESA project. Um, I don't think they have been approved yet, but people are working on it. In fact, uh, people have been thinking of a transient astrophysical observatory on the International Space Station uh, in the same lobster eye design. Okay. Basically, looking at transient uh, phenomena, you don't know where this X-ray uh, you know, flare is going to come from. So you need to monitor. These are all sky monitors. And again, so the, the animals, uh, the compound eye gives you an idea, right? So it's not just a one-way thing, you know. We look at them with some, you know, uh, pity that you know they don't have good resolution or whatever. We learn from them as well. Um, I'll end with uh, one uh, very interesting uh, case. Uh, this is a deep sea uh, 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 animal. Of course, in deep sea, you can't uh, hope to see stars. I mean, you probably will see only. Uh, uh, some sunlight and moonlight um, uh, peering through. Uh, so this is a uh, bobtailed squid, and it has developed one of the most astounding uh, symbiotic relations in nature. Uh, it's, uh, it harbors some uh, uh, bioluminescent bacteria in its uh, folds uh, in the mantle of this squid, and they, the light uh, emitted by the glow emitted by this bacteria basically spills from the underside of the s uh, squid, and there's a lens and uh, and a filter which makes this light mimic that of moonlight. So any predator uh, uh, below this squid, for example, look up and they won't see the silhouette. They would think that this is moonlight, and this is how they uh, escape. So, well, you might say that in this, this has nothing to do with vision. It turns out there's a paper, recent paper, I uh, haven't uh, pointed out here. Uh, the genes associated with the symbiotic uh, relation between the bacteria here and bobtail squid actually evolve from the genes uh, to do with uh, the eyes of the bobtail squid. So it is connected with vision. Anyways, I have, uh, this is a bit of an advertisement. I have written a book which came out uh, this year, is in Bengali, which uh, has all the references and I, there are many, many other uh, 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 aspects to it. For example, nocturnal animal, um, how sensory signals have to uh, uh, adapt to it, uh, is uh, published by Shahid Tashongshud uh, this year. Um, so, let's let me spend a few minutes about um, human beings. I mean, we, we know this, uh, 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 how to navigate uh, uh, 
with stars. We don't. We may not have some of the capabilities of the in, uh, some of the insects. For example, we can't sense polarization, like bees do or uh, uh, dung beetles do. But um, uh, where biology has failed us, we have uh, substituted with uh, culture. For example, we know how to transmit um, this knowledge to uh, the, the next generation. So, for example, um, uh, uh, Australian Aborigines they have uh, they uh, navigate. Uh, when they go from one uh, place to the other place, uh, they have song lines, right? They sing these uh, uh, songs, and sometimes they navigate with stars, which are basically mapped onto the pathways, okay? And they have created folklores and songs, which they would transmit to the next generation, right? But I suppose we are doing it less now because of the gadgets we have. We don't look at the nature. We don't look at the... Uh, we don't, we don't need to look at the sky anymore uh, because GPS can tell us which way uh, to go. But even GPS uh, startles me sometimes. When I uh, use the GPS, it says, head northwest, and I say, which is northwest? But uh, then I can look at uh, the, the, the direction it is showing. Um, it's not a, just a sentimental uh, thing to say or a nostalgic thing that you know we used to do this, we don't do this anymore, and we mourn this fact. I think there is, uh, there may be something that is happening because of our um, the underuse of our, you know, our knowledge of the nature. And there was uh, some experiment that that has been done recently in uh, McGill University. Uh, the 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 function of the uh, directionality, the spatial uh, memory, uh, the wayfinding is done in hippocampus in our brain, and the hippocampus also takes care of uh, uh, episodic memory planning for future. So they found that uh, you know, exercising uh, this wayfinding thing and uh, in our daily lives, it increases the hippocampal function. And an underuse of these functions can lead to cognitive impairment. So I'll stop here and then uh, basically let's look at the sky. Let's, uh, you know, let's not forget the sky. Uh, and uh, if... Uh, not for just amusement, but also to remember our links to the fellow organisms on the Earth that we share with, and our connection with life on Earth and the cosmos. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, sir, for your outstanding and very fascinating lecture. And uh, now this session is open for questions. So if anyone has any question, please raise your hand. Okay. <coughs> okay. Okay, so that first. So because you mentioned about uh, you know lens and mirror for focusing, has anywhere a Jones plate being used? What? Jones plate. You know, in case of Jones plate, you know this concentrate. Not that I know of. Huh? Yeah, but that could be a possibility also, no? Because black and white kind of thing. Yes. Yeah, but not that I know of. Yeah. Okay. In not in nature, I think. Okay. okay thanks. Uh, you talked about the collecting power of the lens of the eye. <coughs> so, in the visual range, um, what does the collecting power depend on? I understood oh, yeah. for the X-ray part. Yeah, uh, the aperture. Oh, oh, for for example, that uh, that particular spider which uh, has a large. Uh, yeah, the rhodopsin large molecules. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the 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 tubes are also large. So it will depend on the structure of the eye, the aperture size, the lens size, and the 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 size of the photoreceptors, which all happen to be very large for that uh, th that spider, and you need that for nocturnal animals. Uh, so my question is regarding that uh, dung beetle. So as you mentioned that uh, dung beetle can see the Milky Way, but uh, in our area, like where we live in now, right, we can't really see the Milky Way. So if I bring a dung beetle in this area, can they see the Milky Way? Oh, you should do the experiment, yes. I, uh, 
Like, do they have oh, that collecting oh, power? Oh, 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 I see. I see. I, I, um, uh, you were talking about the, because of the pollution, light, light pollution, pollution yes. and all that. Yeah. So that would probably, uh, you know, inhibit their uh, ways of uh, ability to navigate. Because uh, light pollution will also kill them, their vision, I suppose. But these so experiments were done in the planetarium, so this this has not been done. This Sir, uh, we have uh, heard about a lot of insects which can see uh, UV rays and infrared rays. So yeah. can they also see like the other spectrum, other than visible spectrum oh yeah. through oh the yes. sky? So uh, oh, 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 so there is an, uh, a problem there. UV through the sky, UV light is sort of scattered away, right? So they won't be able to, uh, even if the organism can uh, is uh, can see UV light, uh, UV light from the stars are blo blo blocked, uh, scattered by the atmosphere, right? And so also infrared, infrared uh, light is absorbed by the atmosphere. So that that they will be limited to only terrestrial stuff. Sir, we also see like uh, the infrared telescopes. How do they function? Oh, you have to go up higher in the mountain okay. or uh, 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 go on a satellite. Thank to you. Yes. Anyone else? Or in the desert okay. where the water uh, uh, moisture content is less. So my question is related to the, uh, the ability of this uh, metals. Are they genetic or is it experience or genetic plus experience both? Because if it is pure experience, then others uh, species should also exhibit, right? Yes, um, um, yes. Uh, so the scope for doing more experiments of uh, on other animals. I don't know the answer to your question. I uh, have not found that in any, uh, uh, this question being asked whether it's genetic or, or not. But you're right. It's not something uh, great, uh, something you know, uh, very very sophisticated. All all they do is just look at as the jumper on the uh, dancer on the dung pile. Look at the orientation of the Milky Way, and keep going, keeping that orientation the same. So other animals should be able to do the same. Um, so uh, it's a scope for more experiments. <laughs> so anyone else? So uh, yeah, so you said uh, in the like in the very beginning about the seals, right? That they are myopic because of the difference in refractive index of their corneal fluid and the air. So the same should hold for us also. But we c we c we are not myopic. Like all of us are not. Myopic. Oh no no, uh, our corneal fluid is different. I mean, uh, I talked about the corneal fluid only of uh, aquatic animals. So like the same principle that the difference in refract refractive index creates that myopic vision. So, like, uh, is the refractive index of our fluid the same as that of the air? Like, it should be the same so that we get the clear vision. Yeah, it should be uh, same as that of air, right? Uh, I should check that. You, it's a good question. I I should check that. It's probably, but let me check. Yeah, only the lens should work. The corneal fluid should not come in the way. Uh huh. How? Okay. Okay. Oh, oh. So you mean the pupil size? Length, uh, the radius of the, uh, okay, okay, right, yes, by its muscle. Yeah. I don't know, you just mentioned that uh, before the talk. I, I don't know about uh, uh, quantitatively, no. 
question. You know, this uh, road of sin, that is a nonlinear material. You know, they use it for generating second harmonics, at least bacterial road of sin. So I was wondering, you know, for example, uh, when they generate these entangled photons, you have this, uh, uh, you know, raw kind of object. Nonlinearity generates, you know, two light fronts, and then this uh, one part of it is entangled. Can has nature made use of, you know, somewhere, you know, entangled photons? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fascinating question. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Fascinating. Thanks. Beautiful talk. Thank you. So, I think uh, this is the end of the talk. So, one more question. Yes. Yeah, I have not found any. Um, I don't know. I have not found any discussion on this. Yeah, the. the this is the corneal fluid, or the, the lens. You're talking about the lens. Oh, the vitreous humor. Right. Yeah. So the evolution of the refractive index uh, is is another fascinating thing. I have not. Uh, yeah, I should like to study that. The for the fishes again. Say, say it again. Yeah, there was, uh, I, I skipped over that. This is, uh, you might find this is very interesting. It's about, um, see, in, in, in the, in, uh, among the aquatic animals, so this is before um, the, uh, the amphibians came on land. Um, um, basically, there was not uh, much of evolution in the eye size because um, through the air, uh, through the water, you can't really go, uh, uh, see far. Um, but uh, when they, some of the animals, uh, sort of peered through uh, water and started seeing the land. And uh, so the idea is that the Buena Vista, the nice view, basically uh, made the transition, uh, urge, uh, created the urge to uh, transit to, to the land. Uh, so there has been some work on the evolution of the eye size in for fishes and when they uh, made the transition to land. Uh, but I have not gone very deeply into that. But there's interesting work, I think I should. Hello. With that, I would like to end the session. Thank you very much. Okay, Thank there is much. some refreshment. <laughs> okay, there is some refreshment out there. Please have it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>